the book of Galatians, written by the Apostle Paul. How is everyone today? Great. If uh, you don't have a Bible, um, if you don't have a Bible, it'd probably be a good idea, just, just letting you know, to, to either grab one in the back or fire up one on your phone maybe or something, um, because we're going to spend some time in the Bible. Um, so just a, just a word of warning, I guess, maybe, I don't know, um, that we're going to be rifling through pages or swiping and moving around. In your Bible app, you'll be searching for mainly three places. Um, so um, if, I'm, I'm Jason Runyon. I'm a, a teaching elder here, um, and I preach from time to time, usually about once a month, um, uh, which is probably more, more than you want of me. Um, but today we're going to be talking, if you've been with us for a little bit, um, we are camped out right now in the fruit of the Spirit. So we're in Galatians chapter 5, and we've been there. There are nine of them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine of them, I believe, and we are on the sixth. So we've been, for the last six weeks, including this week, we've been camped out on the fruit of the Spirit. And today we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit that is goodness. So we did love, patience, kindness, love, peace, patience, joy, joy, I think it was in there, Um, kindness, and now we're on patience. Um, And if you recall, um, in Galatians chapter 5, Paul is writing about the conflict that Christians face. We don't necessarily need to turn there. We've been there there a lot. But in Galatians chapter 5, he's talking a lot about the conflict that Christians face. And in in Galatians chapter 5, he talks about the works of the flesh, right? And And he says that those are evident. It's not very hard to think about what the works of the flesh are. He uses words like drunkenness, envy, strife, right? It's not very hard to think about left up to our own devices, our flesh, which the Bible calls our old man, our sinful selves. It's not hard to come up with what the works of the flesh are. And then Paul contrasts that, and this is the conflict, with the fruit of the Spirit. Those things are harder to come by than the works of the flesh. It's easy for me to be jealous it's easy for me to covet. I mean, right off the bat, if you just go into the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not cover your neighbor's wife, his stuff, his animals, right? And it's really easy for us and me, all of us, to get jealous of what other people have, right? It's a lot more difficult for me to be kind to other people, right? and to be thankful for them and to love them than it is to just right off the bat be jealous of them. It's just how it works. And so there's a conflict, and Paul spends a lot of his time talking about the conflict. And if you remember, Paul has spent a lot of time in this book of Galatians, talking to the church of Galatia and to us, comparing the law with the gospel. And he's he's, he's talked a lot about how the, the gospel is far superior to the law because the Galatians had begun to believe that in order to be in Christ, that they had to adhere to the rules and the regulations of the law. But the law was given, Paul tells us, as a temporary thing. It had an expiration date, like your milk in your your refrigerator. It had an expiration date. God's purpose had always been to replace the law that was written on tablets, Ten Commandments, Moses. We're going to be talking a little bit about him this morning. He had always purposed to replace the Ten Commandments with the law written on our hearts. He'd always intended to do that. And so the gospel is far, far superior. The law was meant to help us define and understand what sin is. And it was meant, the Bible tells us, as a tutor or a guide that could help us understand that we could never measure up to God's perfect standard. We could never do it. We needed help. And that's the crux of this conflict. 
And what Paul does is he lays out the means by which Christians can successfully avoid the works of the flesh and prune those things from their hearts. And it's not by the law, Paul says, it's by the Spirit. And that's where you get into the fruit of the Spirit. Said another way, it's not through any means we have at our disposal. It is only through what, what, what Chris was talking about, the gospel, that we can do it. What Jesus has done for us in a moment in time on the cross, that is the means by which we can, can successfully prune the works of the flesh from our hearts and replace them with spirit-grown fruit. And so today, the, 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 the fruit that we're talking about, not the fruit, but an aspect of the fruit, of the vir, a virtue of the fruit, right? Because we talk about, and I guess people have talked about it in different ways. Um, I've heard it talked about there's the fruit of the Spirit and then all these things are the fruit. I've heard it talked about as if the fruit is the grape and the, and, 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 or the bunch of grapes and there's all the little grapes on it. But the idea is that there's fruit and then there's aspects of the fruit. And today, that, that aspect or that virtue of the fruit of the Spirit is goodness. And so I've got a couple quotes, short quotes, to just to help us kind of set the expectation for, for kind of where we're going today. The first quote is um, from w William Tyndale. He says that God's goodness is the root of all goodness. And that's where we're going to be, that's essentially what we're going to be talking about today. That, that, that God's goodness is the root of all goodness. In, in, in Luke uh, 18, Jesus says uh, the, the religious leaders, uh, people call him good. They say, uh, and then he, he responds, if you remember, he says, why do you call me good? There is no one good except God alone. Now, now Jesus is God, but the point that he was making was he was pointing to his Father in heaven. Right? And that was his goal, that was his purpose here on earth, was to point people to his Father and to only do the things that his, the Father wanted him to do. And, and so even Jesus says, the root of all goodness is found in God. And so the best way that we can understand goodness this morning is to look at how God defines goodness. And uh, the second quote is... Uh, from A.W. Tozer, and he says this, and this is good just in terms of setting expectations. Um, he says that the goodness of God is infinitely more wonderful than we will ever be able to comprehend. I'm not telling you anything that you don't know, but the, the, the reality is that in, uh, what do we got, a half hour, or if you know me, maybe even longer, but in the, in the half hour that we have here, we're not going to put a dent in this, um, but we're, we're, we're going to do our best. And so the passages that we're going to be in this morning, just so that you know ahead of time, we're going to be in Exodus um, 33 and 34. We're going to be in Psalm 145, and we're going to be in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3. And if that sounds like a lot, I'm going to try to not make it a lot. Um, so first, let's pray, and then we can jump into it. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that you love us. Uh, thank you that you are so good to us. You are very, very good to us. Um, if, in, in fact, if, if you did nothing else for us, uh, your goodness would be evident in the fact that you, as Chris mentioned earlier, that you sent your one and only son, your one unique son, your only begotten son, uh, to earth to rescue us, to save us from sin. If nothing else, if nothing else goes right in our lives, that alone, for that alone, we give you glory, we give you praise, and we understand that you are good. You are good to us. And we're so thankful for that. We're thankful for your son and the rescue that he offers. We're thankful for the way that he depicts how good you are. That as we'll talk about today, you are not some aloof God up there who's right all the time, which you are, pointing down at us saying, oh, I'm up here, you guys are wrong, I'm right but you get into our mess. You are the God who, of all comfort. And so your goodness isn't just about being right all the time, although you are right all the time. It's about how, how you come alongside of us, how you save us, how you rescue us, how you feed us, how you clothe us, how you, you, you cry with us. 
And, and your son, the image of the invisible you, depicts that, displays that, demonstrates that so perfectly. Help us this morning as, as we talk about your goodness. Um, help us to, to open our minds, open our eyes, open our ears. Help me uh, to articulate this. We're not here to listen to me. We're here to listen to you. And so we pray that you would speak, speak to us this morning, that you would uh, open, open your word to us this morning as it reveals your goodness. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Um, so we're going to be Exodus chapter 33. Um, God's glory, what we're, gonna, what we're going to see in, in Exodus 33 and 34 is that God's glory is his goodness and that his goodness is his glory. Uh, turn, turn with me if you can to Exodus 33, and we'll, we'll check this out. So start at Exodus 33, this is just after uh, Mount Sinai. This is just after the golden calf situation, and God is fed up. He's, he's, he's fed up. He calls uh, the children of Israel stiff-necked. Um, no sooner does Moses go up onto the mountain to get the law and to hear from God himself, but the people... Um, the people lose patience. The people don't know where Moses went. They don't know what's happening, and they ask his brother Aaron to build him a golden calf, and he does, and they start worshiping it. And, and right in Exodus 33, what we've seen is that God has had conversations with Moses about him no longer going with them to the promised land. Instead, God says, I'm going to send an angel with you as you, lead, as you lead your people to the promised land. You get the sense that God is tired of it, tired of these people. And Moses, in this section, is pleading with God. He's pleading with God to, to go with them. And, and, and we'll get into a minute, but one of the interesting things that he says, Moses says to God, in seeking to, to convince him to go with them, is he says, he says, is it, not with, is it not you going with us that makes us distinct? Meaning, if you are not going to come with us, then we're going to be like all the other people groups who we're going to encounter. Is it not, with, is it not you going with us that makes us distinct from everyone else. And, and that's what the Bible is about. This whole book is about God and the rescue that he offers through his son. And it is what makes Christians distinct and unique. It's God going with us. Exodus 33, verse 12. Moses said to the Lord, See to... See, you say to me, bring this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider too, and this is, this is Moses trying to convince God to go with him. Consider too that this nation is your people. And he said, God said, my presence will go with you. And I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence, this is Moses now, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people from every other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do. Okay, I'll go. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, 
and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see the, the back of my glory, the end of my glory, but my face you shall not see. So, so what is God's goodness? God's goodness, as defined by God, is his glory, and his glory is his goodness. That, that, that's what we see there. And okay, well, what, what, what is that? What, what is God's goodness? Is it, is it just the sum of all of his strengths, uh, of all of his virtues? Well, we see it here. We see it here in Exodus 34. So God tells Moses, okay, this is, I'm gonna, everything I said that I'm going to do, I'm going to do for you. Right? I'm, I'm going to bring you to, up and, and put you in the cleft of the rock, and you're going to see my glory. You're going to see my goodness. It's going to pass by you. And this is what it is. This is how... This is how God himself defines his goodness, his glory. The Lord, it says in 30, uh, Exodus 34, starting verse 5, The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord. The Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. God declares his glory, and as he declares his glory, his goodness, he defines it for us. He says, I am the Lord, the Lord God, who is what? Merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, and keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. That is God's goodness, all, all rolled up. All those aspects of God are His goodness, are His glory. It's what makes Him glorious and good. And notice Moses' response, verse 8. Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped, and he said, If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us. For, if, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. Moses' response to God's declaration of his goodness, of his glory, is worship. He bows down. It's supplication, which is a weird word, but petition, right? He petitions God for something, to go with them. Repentance. He repents not only for his sin, but the people's sin. And then, then he makes the vow the, the, I, then we will be your inheritance. Right? So notice his response to the, the declaration of God's goodness, worship, supplication, repentance, and a vow. Check out verses 29 and uh, 29 to, to 35. So in Exodus 34, uh, verses 29 to 35. And when, when Moses came down from the mountain, so he, all this time he was up in Mount Sinai, when he comes down from Mount Sinai with two tablets of the testimony in his hand, he came down from the mountain. Moses did not know, he did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron, and to all the leaders of the congregation, and they returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all that the Lord had spoken to him on Mount Sinai. He gave them the law. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil. When he went into the tent of meeting to talk to the Lord, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out, he told the people of Israel what, he, what God had commanded. And the people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining. And then Moses would put a veil over his face until he went to speak with God again. 
So the glory and the goodness of God not only demands a response from Moses, right? Worship, repentance, petition, vow, but it also has an impact on him. He reflects God's glory. Whenever he goes into the tent of meeting, the Bible says that he met, meets with God as one meets with someone face to face. In that, those encounters, whatever those encounters look like, Moses came out impacted by that encounter. His face was shining to the extent that when he came out this first time that we just read, everybody was afraid. Everybody ran off. Aaron, his brother, ran off. The leaders ran off. The people ran off. And he had to call them back and say, no, 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 this is what happens. I didn't realize my face was shining, but this is what's going to happen going forward. Every time I go in to see God and, and come out and declare what he's said to you, my face is going to be shining. And it's going to be a little freaky. But what happened and what, what, he, what the writer of Exodus gets at here is that his, his face began to shine less and less. It, used, it would decrease. And so he would put a veil over his face. Not to pull the wool over anyone's eyes about what was happening, but just to, to, to he, he put a veil over his face because the, the glory faded, would eventually fade. So it makes an impact. It makes an impact. The next section we're going to be in is Psalm 145. So if, if you have a Bible, turn to, to, to Psalm 145. But the point here is God's goodness Though beyond our comprehension, as A.W. Tozer told us at the very beginning, if you remember that quote, that it's beyond our comprehension, that, that God's goodness, though beyond our full comprehension, is deserving of all praise. And here in Psalm 45, David takes, David takes God's description of his goodness, right? The, 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 the steadfast loving kindness, the abounding in mercy, and abounding in faithfulness. He expounds on it. Um, in a very, very powerful way. Uh, so, so check out Psalm 145. It's, it's the, the last song of, of the last Psalm of David, and, and there's some interesting things about it that I won't necessarily get into. I guess I'm already starting to get into it now. But, 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 but in, in, uh, in Hebrew, this is one of those uh, Psalms that from the beginning to the end, every line begins with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Right? And so from the beginning to the end, um, which is interesting, but, 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 um, but, but my point here is to talk about God's goodness. So starting in verse 1, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to all the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord upholds all those who are falling and raises up all those whose heads are bowed down. The, Lord, the eyes of all look to you, and you give them food in due season. You open your hand. You satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. 
<clears throat> what you notice here um, in terms of God's goodness is it's not extolled and praised and revered simply because it's moral and right. That's not all that it is. His, his goodness is displayed in his mercy and compassion. So it's, it's not just a God who is aloof up on a cloud somewhere, like I was saying before, who, who, who looks down at us and says, you're wrong all the time. We are wrong all the time. The Bible says that, that everyone sins. There's no one who is righteous. No, not one. But God doesn't sit up in a cloud looking down at us and to, just to tell us we're wrong all the time. And, and, and that's not what, what, what David is highlighting, although he does. God is righteous. He is right all the time. But he's the God who comes down and his goodness is displayed in mercy and compassion. His goodness is not aloof, piously displayed for us, something that we could never reach way, way, way up in heaven. No, what we know from the God of the universe is that he sends his son to demonstrate his love to us, his goodness to us, his kindness to us. His goodness his goodness here in, in seven, they shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. If that sounds familiar, it should because that's what we read in Exodus 34. All those things make God good. And notice he is good to all and his mercy is over all in verse nine over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. His goodness is multicolored. It's like a painting with different hues, different tones, different colors. As you look at it from different angles, it looks more lush. It looks more deep. It reminds me of a... Um, remember the movie Ferris Bueller's Days Off, Days Off? Day Off? So in that movie at the end, Cameron... Is stand, they're, in a, they're in a museum, and Cameron, um, he's, got the, uh, he's got the Gordie Howe jersey on, right, the Red Wings jersey, um, and, and so he's standing in this museum, and, and he's looking at a, a Georges Seurat painting, like a pointillism, um, very uh, post-impressionist, right? It's, it's, it's blotchy, but from a distance, it kind of looks like something. And as you get closer, it's just like little points and little things. And he's staring at this thing. And if you remember from the movie, he's staring at this painting. And then all of a sudden, the, the camera starts going in to the painting. And the focus goes in further and further and further. And so from, from the outside, you see the, the picture of the, the woman sitting in the, in the park or whatever. And then as you get closer and closer and closer, the pointillism, the, the post-impressionist part of the painting comes out because then you no longer see the person. You just start to see the colors and then you see the dots. And, and, and if you remember that movie, it, it's, it's a weird thing. But, but that is what God's goodness is like. And, and that's what A.W. Tozer was after, saying that we're never going to get after this because it, we can't even comprehend it. Because the more we look at it, the tones, the hues, the colors, the blotches, the points, right? It, it, there's just more and more of it to understand and to get. And that is how David describes God's goodness. It's, there's all these different aspects that make up his glory, that make up his goodness. And he says, generations of people will declare how his goodness is displayed in his redemption. Generations of people. There's a redemptiveness to God's, God's goodness displayed here with David writing his psalm, displayed in Moses' day in terms of being redeemed from Egypt and, and being rescued and being, driven, being taken to the promised land and ultimately being redeemed by his son. Like I was saying before in my prayer, God is good. Somebody yesterday during Ryan's graduation said, God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. That is true, regardless of what is going on in your life. 
right now. Because if nothing else, if God has done nothing else to display his goodness to you, he sent his son in a moment in time to rescue you. And if nothing from here on out in your life goes well, that is enough. And that, and that is what makes him good, David says, that he is redemptive. He upholds all who are falling and he raises them up, up all who are bowed down. The goodness of God described here, uh, by, uh, described by God in, in Exodus 34 and now in Psalm 145 um, is, is reflected by those in Christ who are led by the Holy Spirit. And this gets back to the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians. This is the goodness that the Holy Spirit produces in the life of a Christian. And it is the goodness that we demonstrate in our deeds, in our words, in our actions, as we reflect more and more Jesus. Our response to regular encounters with God's goodness are going to be similar to Moses' response and the children of Israel's response, or they should be. And they're going to be similar, or should be similar, to how David responds to God's goodness, to God's glory. Notice David's response here in Psalm, or not even just David's response, but David actually provides responses from other people. He says, I will extol you. I will bless you. Look at the verbs. And then he says, one generation shall commend you, your works to another. So he's not even talking about what he will do, but he's talking about what God's people will do. Generations of God's people will commend your works, God, to another. And if you look at the verbs, they shall declare your mighty acts. They will meditate on your wondrous works. They will speak of the might of your awesome deeds. They will declare. They will pour forth fame. They will make your name, your, your abundant goodness famous, David says. One generation to another, they're going to, they're going to see your goodness. And what are they going to do? They're going to worship you because of it. They're going to praise you because of it. They're going to remember you because of it. And they're going to share it. What happens in and amongst God's people when they are actively talking about, sharing, declaring, gossiping God's goodness is that it, it instills goodness. It encourages goodness. It encourages us all to want to be good as God is good. When, 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 look what he says. He says, he says they, are, they, they shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness, and they shall sing aloud your righteousness. That's why up here, when there's a worship band playing, and we're singing some of these songs, it's why there's something that wells up in you. Maybe you weren't feeling very good about anything this week. Maybe you weren't feeling good about your, your, your behavior this week. Maybe you weren't feeling very good about how you responded this week. Maybe you weren't feeling very good about just the thoughts that were going through your brain this week. But you come here, and you sit in these chairs. It makes it seem like we're in a movie theater. And you, and, and you start singing these songs. Jesus, our redemption, our salvation is in his blood. And something inside of you starts to forget about the mess of the week. Why? Because you are face to face with the goodness of God. His Son. The goodness of God. And as you hear it, and as you hear it talked about, and as you hear it sung about, and as you hear people tell you stories, there's nothing better than somebody coming up to you and telling you about, about, uh, I was on my knees praying for this and that. And this is what God did. Right? There's nothing better than that. There's nothing better than hearing about Someone's experience in the Christian life where God works. I can listen to that all day long. I can listen to that all day long. You come up to me and you tell me about the great movie that you saw last week. Oh, yeah, we went to the movie theater and 
went to a concert, and it was so great. And like, okay, that's cool. Who do you see? What but if you come up to me and tell me about how God worked in your life, I'll listen to that all day long. Why? Because God's goodness is on display. And the means by which we become good via the Spirit is by reflecting God's goodness. And there is no better way to reflect His goodness than to hear about it, to see it demonstrated, to see it on display. It's just, it's, it's just true. You'll be happy to know we're moving on here. Um, God's goodness is transformative as we reflect it more and more. It's transformative as we reflect on it more and more. Like I was saying, the more we hear about it, the more we see it demonstrated, the more we see it displayed, the more we are encouraged towards goodness. I can tell you to go out there and be good, muster up some goodness, and go out there this week and display it to the world. Um, Here's the seven ways to do that. Maybe I post it on Instagram. The top three ways. Here are three ways to to be good this week. Um, If I did that, I think you and I would both have have a challenge, would be challenged challenged to to actually make that happen. Um, But if you see it displayed, if you see it demonstrated, if you see God's glory and His goodness reflected in the lives of other people, it's more encouraging to go out and live like that. I've had that in my life where, where um, there have been Christians, either the same age, younger or older, who, who, who I see not just how they behave, not just how they act, but I see how much they love Jesus. And it makes me want to love Jesus like they love Jesus. I see how much they pray. I see how much they, they, they serve, not because they have to, but because they want to. And it makes me want to do that. I think that's just how we're wired for whatever it is. But God's goodness is transformative. It transforms us as we reflect it more and more. That's where we get to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 is a challenge to get to um, because it's right before Galatians, right after 1 Corinthians, but it's just like small. It's a, it's a couple chapters. It's like, it's like 13 chapters, but if you, you'll miss it. If, if, you'll go by it in a blink. Um, so 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 3, and this is what it says. We'll start at verse, uh, verse 12. It says, and Paul has, just for context, Paul has been talking about, similar to what we've been talking about in Galatians, that, that, the, that the gospel, that the spirit is far superior than the law and flesh. That, that what was given, the law that was given had glory. It was glorious. We talked about that earlier because Moses, is, Moses when he went up to get the law, came down to the people and his face was shining. So there was glory to the law that God had provided to his people. But Paul's point in, in 2 Corinthians here in, in chapter 3 is that the, that the gospel, that Christ, that the Spirit is even more glorious. And so he says in verse 12, he says, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Now, Chris mentioned hope earlier today. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. What is that hope? It is the hope that we, it is the hope that we don't have to be right before God. God makes us right before Him. That's the hope. It's not that, like, like Chris was saying before, if I do enough good things, maybe I'll get to heaven. That's not hope. Hope isn't, I hope that I do enough good things so that when the good that I've done in life and the bad that I've done are revealed to God that the good outweighs the bad. That's my hope. That's not hope. I don't know what that is. Stupidity? 
No, 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 no. True hope is what God provides. And it's not if I do enough right before God, he'll let me in. He'll love me. No, 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 no. God sends his son to live the perfect life, the life that we should live but can't because of sin, to live rightly. And then he is, God is able to gift us his righteousness, Jesus' righteousness. So God makes us right through his son. We don't have to try to be right. He makes us right. And that is the hope. Since we have a hope, now that's hope. Hope, that's hope. I am right before God because of what Jesus did in a moment in time, and I now have a home in heaven, and my sins are forgiven. That is hope. And so Paul says, since we have such a hope, we are bold. We should be bold. Here, here, good outweighing the bad, I can't never be bold. I can never be bold. Because I'm not sure if, 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 if I said the right thing. Did I say the wrong thing to her? Did I say the right thing to her? Did I do the right thing? Did I not do the right thing? I can't be bold here. I, I'm walking a, 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 a tightrope between good and bad. And, and if I fall over to the bad, oh no. But he says, because we have such a hope, we are very bold. We're not like Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not, might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. The glory that was shining on his face was coming to an end, but their minds were hardened. For to this day, when, when they read the old covenant, the law, that same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. He's talking about Jewish people, but he's also talking about all people. All people who believe that if the good outweighs the bad, I will make it. If I can just get the good to outweigh the bad, I can make it. And if we're honest, that's, 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 that's most of the people we know. It's not just Jewish people. It's Catholic people. It's a bunch of people. A bunch of people in this world believe that if their good outweighs their bad, that they'll make it or not. Or maybe they'll just make it because. And, and Paul says those people have a veil. They have a veil over their eyes because it's only through Christ that the veil is taken away. But when one, one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Verse 16, now the Lord is spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all with unveiled faces beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the image from one degree to, of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Paul says that in Christ, we are beholding God's glory, God's goodness. And as we behold God's glory and His goodness, His Son, we are transformed into God, Jesus' image more and more. And we are, we, we are transformed, he puts it, as from glory to glory. We're not like Moses who puts a veil over his face. We shine for a little while and then it dims. No, 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 Paul says. When we behold the glory of God in his son, we are transformed from glory to glory. he He is making us increasingly, talking about goodness here, he is making us increasingly more like his son who is perfect goodness. And then ultimately we will be fully transformed, John says, when I see him, I will be like him. This glorious thing is the gospel. And to gaze by faith into the gospel is to behold who? Look at, look at verse 4 of, 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 of uh, chapter 4. He says, In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. To see him is to see the Father, to behold him. His glory is to behold the glory of the only begotten Son sent from the Father, to gaze at Him, behold Him, learn from Him, consider Him, to know Him over time in the Christian life is to progressively be more conformed to the image of His Son. Romans 8.28, right? Romans 8.28 talks about good, right? Romans 8.28 says that whatever happens in my life, that God will work it out for good, 
right? What is that good? It's to be conformed to the image of his son. That's the good. So when something bad happens to those who love God, if you are in Christ, in Christ, bad things happen. I think we would all agree bad things happen. I've been reading the, the prayer chains lately. I think we can all agree that bad things happen. Amen? Bad things happen. And God promises in Romans 8.28 that when bad things happen, that God will work them out for good. It's not always the good that we want, right? But the good is to be conformed to the image of His Son. That's the purpose. That is the purpose of this book and God's story, is to set apart a people for Himself who are increasingly, increasingly more and more staring into the mirror, staring into the image of his son and becoming more like him. And that is how the fruit of the Spirit works out. That as we, ref- as we stare at the son, as we learn from him, as we are in a relationship with him, we reflect him more and more in our daily lives. In Christ, the most wonderful change is not only possible, but it happens naturally to those who are led by the Spirit and walking by the Spirit. But notice Paul's conditions from 2 Corinthians 3. He says that the veil has to be removed. The veil has to be removed. Right? That, that's, when we're talking about our unsaved friends and family, that is you going out and telling them, and gossiping the gospel, and telling them how good God is, and, and seeking to, like we read in, in Psalm 145, spreading, seeking to spread God's fame of his abundant goodness to your friends and your, and your neighbors, so that they will, they will be interested. But ultimately, it's the God of the universe bringing, bringing them to life, allowing them to, 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 to open their eyes, and to take the veil away. The veil has to be lifted. We have to behold him as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, the goodness of the Lord. We behold his mercy. We, be, we behold his, his abundant faithfulness, his steadfast love that he has for not just thousands, but for the whole world, John 3.16 tells us. And then transformation happens. And we've talked about this already, but, but it, it bears repeating. The transformation that we're talking about, it's right there in, 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 uh, in Galatians 25, uh, which is where we've been. Um, in 25, it says, Galatians 5, 25, it says, if we live by the Spirit, uh, 24, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Number one. Number two, if we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Two things. Two things. Those who belong to Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Verse 24. What does that mean? That means dying to yourself. And there are two things here. Paul is asking us to do two things. He's asking us to believe something, and he's asking us to do something. He's asking, he's, he's asking us to believe that those who belong to Christ are dead to both sin's penalty and its dominion. If you are in Christ, clothed with his righteousness, you believed and trusted in Jesus for your rescue. Then Paul says you need to believe something, even though it may not feel like that on any given day. But he says you need to believe it. And it's true regardless of whether you believe it or not, is that you, in Christ, no longer face sin's penalty, and sin no longer reigns over you. It's true. If you are in Christ, whether you believe it or not, you are dead to sin's penalty and you are dead to sin's dominion. And the second thing he he asks us to do do is to repent. Even though we are free from sin's penalty and, and power, the reality is we still sin. So it's not just taking up your cross every day. And that's not what Jesus, sometimes I talk to people and they're like, well, it's like Jesus said, we need to pick up our cross every day. My cross is my mother-in-law. What? The, what? what are you talking about? My, my cross is my boss. Oh my gosh, my boss. That's not what Jesus is talking about. So get that out of your heads. Your cross is not your mother-in-law. Your cross is not your boss. Your cross is not your kids. Your cross is not your wayward kid. Your cross is, your, 
Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me. What does he mean by that? He means pick up your cross. He means the, picking up the cross and going to a place where you would put the cross down and get nailed to it and be lifted up to be executed is putting to death. He's saying every day, wake up and follow me. And if you're going to wake up and follow me, you're going to have to put yourself to death, your sinful self, your flesh, your old man. You're going to have to put it to death. Take up your cross every day. Make sure the sentence is carried out on your sinful self. Prune, prune your life of the works of the flesh so that you can more and more experience and produce the fruit of the Spirit. In this case, goodness. And then he says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk with the Spirit. Keep in step with the Spirit or walk in the Spirit. And we've talked about this already as well. Led by the Spirit, yielding to His control. Understanding that, yes, the Bible says I, am, I have a fleshly nature. I, there's the flesh. And it says if you live in the flesh, you will die. But if you live in the Spirit, you will live. That always happens in life. If you live in the flesh, you will die. Choose to sin. Choose to suffer. Trust me. Choose to sin. Choose to suffer. Paul isn't saying that, that if you live in the flesh, you will die physically. He's saying that it, he's saying if you choose to sin, you, you're choosing to suffer. And he says if you live in the Spirit, you will live. And in the Christian life, there is this conflict. And the Holy Spirit's job is to guide you over here so that you're living in the Spirit. But your old nature wants you to come here. And that's why Paul says, that, he says, uh, in Romans 7, the good that I want to do, I don't do, and the evil that I wake up not wanting to do, I end up doing. And so Paul says in Galatians 5, 25, that we are to be led by the Spirit. Allow yourself to yield to the Holy Spirit's leanings in your life. And then walk by the Spirit. Active steps. Taking active steps to live here. Active steps to live here so that, again, you, you are pruning the works of the flesh, which are, again, evident. It's not hard to, to find jealousy in your heart. Take a look right now. you probably find it. Oh, there it is. Prune that out and live here in the Spirit. The goodness of God. Reflect it. Reflect it more and more and more. Stare into the sun. Stare in, into the eyes of Jesus, right? Which is a weird thing to say, I guess, but you understand what I mean, right? Use this book. Learn about Jesus. Love Jesus more and more. Reflect on him more and more. And Paul says, like a mirror, like staring in a mirror, fixing yourself, right? That's what we do. We go into a mirror and we, we, we stare into the mirror and we, and, and we look at our, at our reflection. And the, 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 the Christian life is all about looking into the mirror every day and looking more like his son. And God has a work to do in that process. He who began a good work in you is going to finish it. And you have something to do with that. Work out your salvation in fear and trembling. Emphasis on the trembling. Look into the mirror every day and become more like his son. How do you do it? You do it by staring at his goodness, gossiping his goodness, sharing his goodness, spreading the fame of his goodness. And reflecting that goodness. And you do it by doing the hard work, Paul says. Yes, believe that, that you are dead to sin's penalty and to its reign. But also repent. Active daily repentance. Crucifying that, that self that wants its way. And being led by the Spirit. Not just letting go and letting God, but taking active steps to keep in step with Him and to walk with Him. That's, that's how we get to every fruit of the Spirit. But today I was given the topic of goodness, so here's goodness. Um, but I hope that makes sense. Let's, let's just pray.
Heavenly Father, thank you that you are good. Thank you that you are so kind, as we heard about last week. You are so kind. I'm reminded even of, of, of what your word says, what Kirk reminded of us last week, is that your kindness leads us to repentance. Um, I pray that that would happen to us today, that this week, that we would strive to be people who are repenting of sin, turning from sin and turning towards you, turning towards your son. And as we turn towards your son, as we gaze at your son, uh, we, are, we are told in your word that we become more, more and more like him in all his different aspects, in, in his goodness, in his kindness. He's so kind to people. Uh, we think about your, uh, today, just even talking about your abundant mercy, your abundant faithfulness. The life of Jesus was marked by abundant mercy, abundant faithfulness to his friends, to his disciples, to you. Uh, the cry of Bartimaeus, I, I can hear him now. I can hear Bartimaeus. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And what does Jesus do? He hears Bartimaeus and he rescues him. Makes the blind man see. He is so good. I pray that we would reflect that goodness more and more. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.